Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to that place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three, do you think, was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Dear friends in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. So what is so good about this good Samaritan? He's never called good in the story you just heard, yet the word has stuck with him so well that he's known worldwide by, the name, by that name. The story I learned early on in Sunday school, now part of summer Sunday school preaching series, the story of the Good Samaritan. As well as being part of our church life, this story has actually reached out into our, our society, our community. We now have Good Samaritan laws that protect those who come to the aid of someone else, help the, help the helper, they help the helper from being sued, they keep the helper from being sued. Marcia and I recently finished watching the TV series The Crown, and the last season of that show dealt extensively with the death of Princess Diana. When she died several years ago now in that car accident, the paparazzi were criticized for snapping photographs instead of coming to her aid, like the Good Samaritan did. If you're a Seinfeld fan like I am, you know the final episode of that series dealt with the Good Samaritan law, as Jerry and George and Kramer and Elaine are charged under that law because they didn't come to the help of this man who was being robbed at gunpoint. Both in our culture and in our church, the word good is firmly stuck to the Samaritan. And maybe we use this word good about the Samaritan because we have a strong sense of in the story, the priest and the Levite. Now maybe as a pastor I'm kind of overly sensitive, but it seems like in stories, television shows, movies, the clergy never come off well. And they certainly don't in this story. They just don't. After the father is robbed and beaten and left for dead, what do the priest and Levi do? Well, they pass by on the other side. The insinuation being not only do they, do they not stop and help, they go to the other side of the road. They want nothing to do with this traveler. However you read that action, they are the bad guys of the story. But when we analyze this parable in terms of good and bad, it can lead us down the wrong track. As I mentioned, the Samaritan is never called good. What he is called in the parable is merciful. I've never heard it myself, but one scholar said he's heard this parable called the, the parable of the merciful Samaritan. It's a more accurate title. Might not seem like a great distinction, but mercy is quite different than goodness. You tend to make good and bad in moral categories, in which we pigeonhole people. And there's bad people. And I get, I understand why we do that. It's kind of an easier way to understand the world, but it's misleading. Our theology tells us, after all, we're both good and bad. We're all saint and sinner at the same time, in the same person. But mercy, mercy is a different kind of word. When you look it up in the dictionary, the word that's most used to define mercy is the word compassion. Be merciful is to have compassion for someone else word that very well describes the attitude of the Samaritan to this traveler. 
Mercy is a word that suggests not only compassion, but even leniency. It's about pardon, kindness, strength, and even rescue and generosity. It's a word that can hold a lot, a word with some depth to it. Mercy is a good word to keep in mind as we ent enter a heightened political season this late summer and into the fall, right? That's what we've been coming, coming up in front of us. Elections have always been full of disagreements and controversy. It's always been that way. And I don't know if it's just me, but there seems to be much more of a tendency these days to demonize those on the other side of the political aisle. In the midst of all of that, be merciful to those who see things differently. And you might ask in the midst of that topic, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do in our political world these days? Well, I believe he would stand up for what he believed in. Jesus always did, right? But at the same time, he would be merciful to those on the other side. Stand up for what you believe in and yet be merciful. You can do the same thing at the same time, whether it's politics or another issue. Jesus' calling to each one of us is to be like that Samaritan and be merciful, to go and do likewise. Mercy is also a word that helps us to kind of relate to the parable. So put yourself into the middle of this story. Who do you resonate with? Who strikes a chord with you? Where are you in this parable? I would imagine we can all relate to the priest and the Levite. When we encounter a person in need, we've all passed by on the other side. That's a story that could describe any one of us. Might have happened on the highway like it did in this story when you come upon a stranded traveler, not, maybe not beaten and left for dead, maybe someone who's run out of gas, who has a flat tire, whose engine is overheated on a hot summer day. When you've seen them, you've had thoughts of mercy, thoughts of compassion, but you've also had reasons for not stopping. Maybe you're in a hurry. Things to do, places to go, you're on a schedule. Or maybe you were worried about your safety. Stopping to help a total stranger always has its risks. We all know what it's like to be that priest or that Levite. But in our good moments, we also know what it's like to be that Samaritan. And when I think about that, I think of the, the, the team we've put together that's helping this refugee family from Venezuela. That family, like the traveler on the side of the road in the story of the Good Samaritan, they, they came from the road, in a sense. All refugee families do in some way or another. They came from the side of the road because they were a family without a home, at least for a time, with no place to come to call home because the origi their original home had become unlivable. Living on the road, they're dependent on the compassion of others to feed them and house them and befriend them. Living on the road, they're dependent on the Good Samaritans, or, or should I say the merciful Samaritans, the merciful Samaritans of this world. As to the question of who you are in the parable, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan, there's a character that we're missing. There's a character that we'd rather not relate to and that's the traveler, beaten by the side of the road and left for dead. Out of all the characters of this parable, this traveler may be the least appealing. The Samaritan's clearly the star of the show. But even the priest and the Levite have their appeal. They don't show mercy, but at least they have some sense of dignity and control of their situation as they move on with their lives. The traveler, on the other hand, is totally in need. He has no clothes. No money, no resources, nothing to commend him to us. And yet the way we worship, the way we worship and how we worship tells us that we also are those in need of mercy. One of the most common prayers of the church throughout the history of the church is, Lord, have mercy. Or in Greek, Kyrie eleison. We sang that phrase over and over this year during the season of Lent. One of the few times we sing in a foreign language, we sing, in, we sing it in Greek. One of the things I love about the liturgy, our order of worship, is that when we repeat that prayer on many different Sundays, time and time again, it gets, it gets into our bones. It becomes part of who we are. Standing alongside family and friends and fellow worshipers, petitioning God and calling down God's mercy. We begin to see ourselves as those who need mercy. We begin to see ourselves as that traveler by the side of the road. We begin to see ourselves as people like those refugee families now coming to Billings. All of us facing difficulties in life. All of us with sins and regrets. All of us 
in need of strength and blessing and rescue. All of us on the road, all of us who have had wine and oil poured on our heads and been blessed, all of us made neighbors in Jesus Christ. So whenever you hear this of this good Samaritan, remember that he is much more than good. He is merciful and full of compassion. The Samaritan reminds us as well of Christ himself who finds us on the side of the road, binds up the wounds of our sins, forgives us, and sends us down the road into a life that's made new. Having been so shown such mercy ourselves, we are sent out into the world as mercy bearers. We are sent out to be more than good, but to be merciful. Amen. We now sing our hymn of the day. It's Jesu, Jesu.